this block here was horrible before we started working on this block. As a matter of fact, next block over there kind of shows the condition of how this block looks. So you see all these houses that... So now we're going to walk down to a building that shows you the old construction, how the, the original builders built these houses before. So you all can kind of walk through that. You're going to get a contrast to see how when their development does their total gut and why you want to do a total gut. Here. How's everyone doing today? Today, we're going to continue our discussion on investing with Baltimore City with a higher purpose. And we're going to spend today's session on speaking and learning more about Baltimore City. I think a lot of people come to Baltimore City to invest in Baltimore City without really understanding what the city is about, knowing the history of the city, why the city actually has over 16,000 blighted properties how many neighborhoods are actually in the city, and a different type of culture and mores are in different neighborhoods. Then we're also gonna talk about how to buy the block and why that's important when you talk about investing in Baltimore City to have that kind of mindset that you don't wanna just buy a house in a one-off location, but you wanna buy a, multiple properties on one block. You wanna buy as many properties on the block as you possibly can, and you wanna to try to control that block and that's where you can really begin to affect and impact change, not only for the community itself, which is investing with a higher purpose creed, but also in creating your own comps, because that's the biggest challenge in Baltimore City is you're dealing with the issue that there's a still racist mindset and systems concerning comp value or determining the, the actual uh, real estate value in these black neighborhoods. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So I want to begin by bringing up my screen here and sharing with you the tool that I use to go through my presentations. It's called the brain. And again, we're going to always talk about the seven keys to real estate developing for conscious leaders, because that's key and that's critical to really understand these seven keys. Strategy, neighborhood, condition, price, social capital, team, and systems. So again, today we're going to really drill down on the actual neighborhood because you really want to understand Baltimore City from that perspective. So within that being said, I'm going to share with you my screen and I'm actually going to put into the actual um, chat window for you as well, the site that you really want to get familiar with when you really want to understand the different neighborhoods in Baltimore City. And I'm always going to share with you free sites that you really can begin to learn. And this site here is Live Baltimore. I'm going to put this link in the chat so that everyone can actually have this. You can have access to it. But again, this site is free. And I definitely encourage you to spend some time learning how to utilize this free tool to really aid you in your real estate development. Now, this tool was not really geared or created for real estate developers. It was really geared toward home buyers to really get familiar with the city. But again, as a developer, as an investor, you want to learn what homeowners are looking for, potential home buyers are looking for, so you can buy properties and renovate accordingly. Now, the great thing about this tool, I'm actually, uh, let me scroll back to the original homepage, I'm sorry. So this is the homepage of Live Baltimore. Live Baltimore is a nonprofit that's funded by the city that helps people who are interested in moving to Baltimore City understand some of the different home buyer incentive programs, 
uh, what best, what are the different neighborhoods, what are the options, features, and amenities that each neighborhood has to offer, and just really a great tool for really getting to understand and learn about Baltimore City as a whole. Now, what I went to, and again, this is the homepage, and you can see right off the bat, it tells you that you have more than 250 neighborhoods to explore in Baltimore City. Use this tool to explore by neighborhood, name, or geography. So right there, you can refine your search by vibe, neighborhood amenities, or average housing costs by clicking filter neighborhood. So like I said, free tool, great resource for you to use. And you can see right here that the neighborhoods are listed in alphabetical order. So if you know Baltimore City, then you can search for a neighborhood by its name if you're that familiar with it. Or if you don't know Baltimore City or you get to know Baltimore City for the first time, then I would suggest that you, what you want to do is you want to begin to just search for by actual neighborhoods themselves. And you click on the neighborhood link here and you say explore Baltimore City neighborhoods. Now, real quick, before I click on that link, you can see here's some other amenities you can look for or some other features that each neighborhood has. Now, again, this is really geared toward home buyers, but you want to know this information because you're eventually going to be marketing your properties that you purchase and that you renovate to either home buyers or business individuals like myself who are advocating building business generating residences out of single family homes. But you still want to know this information, such as if it's artsy, if it's by the water, if it's close knit, if it's community commuter friendly, meaning that you can get transportation, public transportation to jobs or businesses. It's a green historic, kid-friendly, lively, quiet, or walkable. So those are some of the uh, 10 characteristics that describe a neighborhood, but we're gonna drill down a little more deeper. So we're gonna click on Explore Neighborhoods here. And that's gonna bring up this interactive map, which is, I believe, like I said, is a great tool. And that's what I love about investing in Baltimore City. It has some of the best tools that you can really use and really help you understand uh, Baltimore City directly from your computer before you even try start driving through the different neighborhoods and you know wasting a lot of time because that could be very time wasting so you can see here that pictures of different neighborhoods and you know you can click learn more so what i can do here several different ways i can explore i can click here and go to a neighborhood such as allendale and you can see i can zoom in even more by clicking on the arrow key here to zoom and I can get closer to the streets. So you can see Old Frederick, Penn Lucy, you know, so this is just one neighborhood in particular. You, again, you can zoom out as well. You, so great tool for that. You can actually, uh, Boyd Booth, I can click on that. So I know that neighbor is on the west side. It's a neighborhood that I've done some developing in. Some of the properties are that I currently control through lease options is near the Boyd Booth uh, neighborhood. And so, that tells you neighbor at a glance. See, look at the information it gives you. Estimated mortgage is $109. <laughs> Think about that. It tells you it's walkable, but then the estimated mortgage is $109. Where can you get a mortgage for $109, right? Now, again, there's pros and cons to this information that you're getting. Because what I'm advocating is really data-driven type of real estate investing. You want to let data drive your decision-making on where you're going to purchase, why you're going to purchase, how much you're going to spend, how much you're going to renovate, all those things, but that's, remember, that's part two to the seven keys because the first thing is your strategy. So you should already have what your strategy is gonna be. Now, again, I propose, and what my particular strategy is, lease options is my extra strategy. So everything that I'm looking for is coxed within that context. So I'm always looking at how, whether it's commercial property or as a residential property, can it fit my lease option scenario as an extra strategy. And again, I definitely highly, highly recommend that before you start buying in Baltimore City, you really wanna think through which strategy you wanna use. Are you gonna buy a property to wholesale? Which means you're gonna buy a property, negotiate with the property owner, and then sell it to another investor. And then you're gonna add your profit in there just for going out, finding that property and negotiating that deal with the particular property owner. And that wholesale fee can be anywhere from $5,000 is probably the lowest that people I saw charge, or it could be $2,500 depending on the margins and how much room is in the deal. 
and you know how you structure it up to $25,000 if you really find a great deal that you were able to locate that's not on the market. Now, the properties on the market is advertised, then it's not gonna really be $25,000 worth of profit. So again, those are the kind of deals you gotta put some marketing effort into yourself and get people contacting you, and then you can probably get that kind of a spread. Now, personally, for me as a business owner, I don't really think you should be charging $25,000 wholesale fee on a residential property in Baltimore City. And I'll explain why. Because nine times out of 10, what you're doing is you are taking away the equity from the property owner. If it's $25,000 for you to really gain some room for your profit, that's money that really should be going to the property owner, right? And the property owner, the only reason the property owner is probably not getting that kind of return is because of their ignorance as it relates to the real estate and the market conditions and those things. So don't exploit the ignorance of the potential property owners in Baltimore City. I'm not teaching people to do that. I'm not advocating that. And again, if I find out people are doing that, I'm going to definitely let people know to look out for you because you're a bad business person. You don't need $25,000 from a residential property deal for just going out, negotiating a deal and selling it to an investor. That to me, nothing you can justify to me warrants a $25,000 wholesale fee maybe $5,000 or $10,000. And see, what I've learned by doing wholesales is that a lot of times, if you're honest with the property owner, you let them know you're going to charge a fee anywhere from $5,000 to $10,000 and that you are in business and that your job is to help them solve their problem. They have a problem, which is the property itself. That's a problem for them because more likely it's vacant. It's not performing. So they're not generating any money from it. And then it's getting into issues of being blighted, which means the city can come out and put liens and fines on it. People can break in and steal, the, steal things like the copper pipes from the property. Uh, they could just break in and it's getting near winter time now. So folks will break in just for the warmth of it. You know, So you eliminate one of their problems for, them, for the property owner and that property owner would be more than happy you know, to pay you a $5,000 fee from the sale of their property, because what you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to take your property. I'm going to market it out to my network of potential investors who will buy your property from me you know, or, you know, through you, your property, but I'm going to be the person that goes out and markets it for you and let the investor know. And I'm going to package it in such a way that the investor wants to buy it. And if you want $30,000 for the property, ma'am, I'm going to go out here and I'm going to try to sell the property for at least $40,000 to an investor so I can make $10,000. And the investor is really, you know, doesn't want to pay uh, 40, they might want to pay 35, then your fee is $5,000. And so that's a fair, equitable arrangement where you've done some work for the property owner, but the property owner gets the bulk of the actual profits because it's their property. You've done nothing but just do some work uh, run some numbers. You don't, nothing you've done warrants $25,000. Now, if it's commercial property, that's a whole different animal. It's a whole different uh, perspective on that. And you're dealing with a whole different class of uh, property owners as, as well as investors. So that's kind of let the buyer beware. And most people, you won't get that kind of return on the, on a commercial property unless you're dealing with a couple of hundred grand type deals so yeah, and it's gonna, it's gonna take you a whole lot more work to get that deal done. So yeah, that could warrant a twenty-five thousand dollar wholesale fee. But let's stick with residential properties for right now. And like I said, if you're gonna be a conscious person, if what I'm saying appeals to you, then don't try to go more than ten thousand dollars. I don't care how much equity is in the property. That property owner brought that property. They went through what they've gone through, especially if it's a homeowner selling their property. They've lived in it for years. They deserve that equity let them have that equity. You focus, if you want more profit, do more deals. Think of it that way. Expand your portfolio, do more deals, but don't try to eat so much off one deal, right? And plus you can get sued. That probably owner later on finds out that you didn't tell them, you didn't fully disclose what the real value of the property was. And they find that out, they can sue you. Or they can just sue you for the, just because they found out later on because someone turned them on to it, that you made $25,000, they can still sue you. Now, again, whether they're justified in suing you or not, it's a whole debatable uh, scenario. But my point is people can sue you for anything and then you gotta go to court and deal with that. And you don't wanna spend your time in court 
and you don't want to taint your reputation as an investor in the Baltimore city because it's a very small city by being someone who does unscrupulous practices. So just have that kind of mindset going in. All right, so again, going back to the Boyd Booth neighborhood, we see that estimated mortgage is $109. Now again, that's the mortgage. That's people who are property owners and that's what their current, there's not a lot of sales activities, not a lot of homes are being sold and new mortgages are being taken out. So that's based off years of uh, data because Boy Booth is really, as you can see, a very small area. Uh, a lot of properties are on blighted blocks. So not a lot of new activity in the Boy Booth area. So that's why those numbers are what they are. Estimated rent is still, and look at the estimated rent, look at the difference. Just point out some key things. Look at the difference between someone who owns a property, which is $109. I mean, they have a mortgage on it. And someone who's renting a property, that's almost 10 times the number the difference in the monthly payment. So that's just food for thought right there. But right? I always advocate owning is better than renting. No matter what someone else may say, I always believe you should put your, position yourself to be either an owner or a control of the property. That someone else own it, you control it using lease option techniques. And we'll talk more about how you set those up in a whole different, another session, because that's really... I would say the advanced section of what we're going to be building on. So now you look at the medium home purchase price, $16,000. That's why the mortgage is $109. But again, interesting to point out that a medium home purchase price could be $16,000, but you can still rent it out for $1,000. Very interesting information there. So I would say do your research and find out why. You know, those numbers to me stand out like, wow, really? I can buy a house for $16,000 and then rent out for $1,075. Why is that? You know, and do your research. Home types, row homes, own versus went. And here's, here's a key difference. 27% of the people in the Boyd Booth area, which again, Boyd Booth is a very small neighborhood. 27% of the people own their properties where 73% rent their properties. See, right there, this little uh, six facts are so much information helps me determine whether, excuse me, I want to go to this neighborhood and invest in any particular property in the Boyer Booth area, which I don't, you know, because I know enough about that area. Like I said, it's, it, most of the properties there are blighted, a lot of drug activity. You're not going to get anybody who has options as far as potential renters or potential buyers to buy one renovated house in any neighborhood. I'm sorry, on any block in the Boy Booth neighborhood. Then you see the surrounding neighborhood, Shipley Hill, Penrose, Fair Street Outreach, and then Union Square. A lot of the properties that I currently work with, my partner in the lease option phase are in the Penrose, Fair Street Outreach neighborhood. And let's click on that neighborhood right now. And we'll see here, kind of, you see this neighborhood's a little larger than the Boy Booth neighborhood. And you see Booth here, Booth Street. You can see that, that you know that that's, Again, it's bordered as this neighborhood, but you see estimated mortgage is $119. Now that's not true for a house that's been purchased and renovated. Again, same thing with Boy Booth. This is based on historical mortgages where people have owned their properties for more than 20 to 15 years and their house they brought for like 30 to $40,000, not somebody, or $17,000. But you're not buying a house that you can actually live in for $17,000 or that you would want to live in. Let me say that. So again, as an investor and you have a product and your product is properties, you're not going to be able to buy a property for $17,000 anywhere in Baltimore City and put someone else in it and charge them $1,085 for rent. That scenario is not happening. So that's what you're thinking. Get that thoughts out of your head already. If it's you're buying it for $17,500, you're going to have to put about $50,000 to $60,000 renovation-wise in order to make it happen. So... Again, home types, rural houses. Now you see the own versus rent ratio is significantly different. This is 40%, 46% ownership, and then 54% rental. All right. So now with that being said, you go down, scroll a bit more, and you see nearby public transportation. There's 25 minutes for DWI, 10 minutes from Charles Center, 15 minutes from Penn Station, easy access to the mark, biter and scoop. So walk, walk score bike score, all that's really good information. Gives you a quick picture of some of the type of houses that exist in the Penrose Fair Street Outreach neighborhood. 
All right. Now it gives you a realtor. You can reach out. That's because the realtor is a member of Live Baltimore. They have members who are realtors or, or brokers, and they get at you know they pay for advertisement. And you can reach out to her if you're a potential home buyer. I don't know how effective she'd be as an investor agent, but again, I suggest reach out to her and have a conversation with her to see can she help you with your investment information. Everything is learning at this stage. And this, this video is really designed for folks who are learning new information about Baltimore. If you already know information about Baltimore, then I think you should find a better time or to invest your, and then instead of sitting here criticizing this video. So again, this is Live Baltimore, great tool. Not gonna really spend a lot of time on it today, but I just kind of want to familiarize you with it um, so you can kind of see exactly how to use this tool and where you can get information from. So now we're going to switch back over to my brain because I want to kind of go into uh, what I consider the neighborhoods more specifically from here. So again, from the seven keys, remember, strategy, neighborhood, condition, price, social capital, team, and systems. Now, real quick, what I'm going to show you before I get into the neighborhoods a little more detailed, I'm going to show you what I consider the conscious community model so you can see where we're going with this with the round table. My focus is always buying properties for the purposes of leasing those properties out, lease to own. But my focus is more geared toward now business generating residences. And so what I'm showing you here is just uh, five property types that we focus on making and converting from single family homes. I'm no longer interested in buying a house and ring out to a homeowner. I've done that, had some bad experiences with it, and just really realized that for the risk to reward ratio, it's better to deal with people who are business-minded individuals instead of just individuals and their goal is only home ownership or I need a place to stay. I want to focus on individuals who really want to change their lives and, and generate revenue that's a better person for me to talk to because now it gives me more options as far as how I work with them and the way our relationship is structured. So again, just quickly, we got assistant living residences, we got business incubator housing, we got e-health and e-learning homes, grocery store co-ops, and child development residences. And what I'm showing you is acquisition price. So let's go back to assistant living residences, number one, acquisition price of $50,000, which is where our so that's kind of me from an exercise standpoint. I establish here's what I'm looking to pay, and I, I expect my budget to be around anywhere between fifty. Again, that's a give and take, fifty up to seventy-five thousand dollars. I have a twenty-five thousand dollar plus or minus ratio there, and that depends on the deal, the neighborhood. So, in other words, I'll pay twenty-five thousand dollars more than my budgeted price if it's a property that's on a block that I already have a property on. Right there, that property is much more valuable to me than a property that's not on a block I own. So just giving you the idea on some of the way I think and how I process this information. I said my renovation budget is going to be about $50,000. Again, that's going up since I created this little slide. So now we're really about maybe $65,000 because of inflation and the price of uh, supplies and materials have gone up considerably. So it's no longer going to be $50,000 but the after repair value is still hovering around 250. Now, why do I say 250? It's because this property generates revenue. And so what I'm saying is I can generate $13,500 a month gross revenue as an assisting living facility. So that's what's giving it at the $250,000 value because anybody who buys this property from me, they can generate that kind of revenue, not to live in, but because they're going to use their property as a business generating re residence. And I'm not going to talk too much about assisted living residences in this particular discussion because I don't want to get you too overwhelmed. I just want to give you an idea of what my extra strategy approach is. Then in business incubator housing, same thing, where we're looking at an acquisition price of 50, renovation price of 75, after repair value 175, and then you can generate roughly on a lease option 1750. Now you see those numbers are significantly different. You probably want to ask, why would I even do a business incubator house when I can generate 13.5 off a assistant living? Well, assistant living requires quite a bit of work, uh, certifications, 
Uh, the process takes longer as a result of COVID. So there's a lot more people involved in that decision and getting that kind of cut, that kind of return. So it's not an instantaneous deal just because the property is renovated, it's done. You gotta have a whole assisted living business around that. And if you don't have that business experience, then you can't play that game at this stage. So a game that, uh, that you can really get involved in out of all of these projects listed here is the business incubator housing. That's one that's going to be easy, uh, it's simple to get in, but you see the return is not that great on a monthly option, but it still can be very profitable for you. So let's go back here to neighborhood now. Uh, what I want to talk about neighborhood, and this is a very important part of the presentation, is I want to drill down on what we've done within the round table, because my background is system engineering. And with, as a system engineer, I always like to put things in categories and segment them so I can understand how better to deal with things based on them being in a category as opposed to just random properties. So I came up with a block classification uh, system that helps me determine how I want to classify a block. And I can make, and I can teach you if you're a member of the round table, how to make these decisions as well and what constitutes what type of block. So let's go with the first block, A block. So A block kind of looks like this, right? And A block typically is a block where the properties are, um, it's 100%, 90 to 100% homeowners, not a lot of renters on that block. And it's pretty much no vacant properties, no blighted properties on that block. This is one of those ones you get where you really have to do a lot of marketing and you hope when someone does sell, they're selling you a property and you can buy it as a property someone's owned for 40, 50 years. They just need to be remodeled, needs to be updated. And you can walk in and put about maybe 10 to $20,000 in that kind of scenario. That's the A block, not the kind of blocks I'm looking for. You can't buy a block type of strategy with the A block. Because again, it's going to be a block that looks like this, a nice block, clean block, not a lot of blighted properties, probably no blighted properties. It may be one vacant property. It's not going to be vacant for long. And this kind of block that most people are looking for for home ownership. So now we go to the B block. The B block is a little less than the A block in the context that the B block is going to be homes that are um, predominantly, I would say, is going to be about an 80 to 20% renter ratio, where 80% homeowner, 20% renter. So we got some renters because some homeowners have moved out. They want to still hold on to their property. So they're renting their property out, but they rent it out to a high end tenant a tenant who actually has some money, who has options, and who wants to live like a homeowner in a very nice established block or a nice neighborhood. Again, not going to be any blighted properties, not going to be able to buy the block. So again, A and B type blocks don't appeal for my exit strategy, made for yours, but not for mine. Now we get to the C block. Now we begin to start to look at a block that really begins to start attracting my attention. Still don't really go for a lot of C block type scenarios because again, looking at about maybe a 65 to 70% home ownership to renter ratio, meaning that 65% of people in that block are homeowners. It's still not gonna be, um, may have one or two blighted properties, but it won't be blighted for long, meaning that someone's buying that property and the property owners know the value. So you're gonna pay a lot more for that property because again, um, it's, on the, it's on a nice block. Right, you have homeowners, people in that block care about how that block looks. People, it's real established. So again, that's going to warrant a higher price in purchasing that shell. And it's not really going to be a shell, more likely, but that blighted property is going to command a lot more money from you. So that's the cons of a C block. But again, the pros still very established block. You don't worry. You don't have to worry about trying to recreate the block. So if you're just looking for a one-off type scenario. A C block may be beneficial for you, the type of blocks you're looking for. I like to focus on the D blocks and F blocks. The D block meaning now we get into the point where it's about what you saw before when I went through the Boyd Booth and more particular the Penn Rose Fair Street Outreach neighborhood where we got a 40% to home ownership ratio where um, most of the block is rented. There are some homeowners. I look at them as my anchor tenants to build with. Those are the people I want to build around. I come there and induce myself to those homeowners. Typically, Baltimore City has block captains. So I would induce myself to the block captain, let them know what my plans are. I intend to renovate these properties 
as a rent to own scenario. I'm not going to put Section 8 people in your neighborhood. Again, nothing wrong with Section 8. I'm not saying anything to discourage or disparage anybody in Section 8. Again, it's just not my strategy where, because again, there's a stigma with Section 8. Let's just be real. So homeowners don't want Section 8 people in their neighborhood. That's the reason I'm saying that. It's not, I don't have anything personal against people in Section 8, but if you're going to do Section 8, Section 8 has a rent to own program, and that's a whole different animal. So if you do Section 8, I would say, and you want to be an investor with a higher purpose, a conscious investor, go with the Section 8 rent to own because at some point you're dealing with someone who wants to own their property and wants to change their condition that they're in. They're looking for some help. And that's a great way to really begin to help those individuals. But going back to the block, you can see right now, there's going to be several blighted properties on that block that it's going to be looking boarded up that you can look at purchasing. Once you purchase one, you might be able to purchase two. You can talk to the homeowners and find out how long these properties have been vacant. And you can really get a lot of good data on this block. And these are great blocks to really kind of learn about and begin to build with the community to help change these blocks. This is a block I recommend that if you're new to real estate investing, you're new to Baltimore City, but and you really want to implement the buy the block strategy, this is a D block is where you want to, you kind of want to get started. And we can have discussions about that. I would say email me, reach out to me, and let me know if that's what appeals to you. Because I'm looking for individuals to help me buy up the D block as I begin to raise capital for that purpose. And then finally, we go down here to the F block. And the F block looks like this, right? Where it looks like somebody dropped a bomb on that neighborhood. Houses have no roofs. They have no back walls. Most of the addresses are just front facades. It's going to cost you over $100,000 to do the renovation of these properties. So F block is definitely a block. You look to buy the block, not buy one or two houses on that block, but you want to buy the entire block if you can so you can begin to control that comps in that neighborhood and create the value of the neighborhood this is a lot of heavy lifting, though. This is not something I recommend. If you're new to real estate investing, this is not the strategy I recommend at all. This will get you losing your money, losing your investors' money, and just really tying your capital. Because this type of expenditure of time and effort is years. I'm talking about four, five, seven, sometimes even 10 years to kind of pull off this kind of development effort. You got to raise capital on the front end. You got to be a structure to capital. You got to be able to assemble the properties. A lot of effort, a lot of work. And it's definitely not new. It's definitely not for someone new to real estate investing. Let me say it that way. So I'm going to keep this presentation pretty short today because I don't want to overwhelm you. A lot of information. I just really want to talk with you about the Live Baltimore 2. And then again, I wanted to share with you kind of the different block delineations I came up with as we talk about Again, the seven keys to real estate development for conscious leaders. Again, remember, strategy, neighborhood, condition, price, social capital, team, and then systems. Now, again, remember, this is in hierarchical order as well. Price is number four. I've gone through that before. I'm not motivated by somebody just telling me the price. I want to know, does it fit my strategy first? What kind of neighborhood is it in? What kind of block is it on, A through F? What's the condition of the property? Then we get to the price, right? So again, just want to share that with you. I hope you all enjoy this session number two on understanding Baltimore City. Uh, again, I highly recommend to live Baltimore too. I put in the chat for you to begin to utilize and become familiar with that too. And until our next session, which will be next Wednesday, I look forward to building with you all. Thank you for your time and effort. And I just want to bless and release everybody who listened to today. If you got questions, uh, reach out to me. King at kingconnections.org is my uh, email address. And you can email me questions that you may have. I mean, this is going to be a 10-part series. We're really going to talk about how to do it, investing with a higher purpose in Baltimore City. Thank you for your time. Great day. My name is King. I'm a chief value creator for the Conscious Real Estate Investors Roundtable, a company whose mission is to bring economic transformation to Baltimore City through real estate and business development. We are investing $52 million over the next five years 
into redeveloping over 300 residential homes, commercial businesses in Baltimore City. Our goal is to look for and identify other conscious-minded investors and developers who want to invest and develop with a higher purpose. If that sounds like you, then we have a series of tours and workshops that we're going to be able to help you understand to get more information on investing in Baltimore City, how to analyze the neighborhood in Baltimore City, how to implement a buy the block strategy in Baltimore City, to learn more information about the Opportunity Zone and how to create an Opportunity Fund. But more importantly, you're going to learn how to engage with local stakeholders and do development without displacement. If it sounds like something you're interested in and you want to be a part of the movement, come to our website at ConsciousRT.com, the C-O-N-S-C-I-O-U-S-R-T.com, you see on the banner, and join us for one of our tours. And I guarantee they will not only change your life, but you will change the life of thousands of Baltimoreans as well. Thank you for your time.